Can you hear me? Good evening to everyone. We're truly thankful for your presence tonight, and we hope as we gather in the middle of the week to study God's Word that much good will be accomplished and no harm done at all. I'm thankful to the elders who have given me this opportunity to stand before you once again and to bring a lesson from God's Word. A couple of things before we get to our lesson. Let me share with you, and then we'll, we'll get to the lesson. You know, uh, we keep talking about how severe the re- recession is and how bad things are. And uh, if you listen to some people, it won't be long to end the world or be here shortly or whatever. But there's some things to ponder to think about. If you have food in the refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, a place to sleep. You are richer than 75% of this world's population. If you have money in the bank, in your wallet, and spare change in a dish around the house somewhere, you are among the top 8% of the world's wealthiest. If you woke up this morning with more health and illness, you are more blessed than the millions who will not survive the week. If you have never experienced the danger of battle, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony of torture or the pains of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people in this world. If you can attend a church meeting without fear of harassment, arrest, torture, or death, you are more blessed than three billion people in this world. Think on these things. And then let me share this with you. I think that uh, everybody needs a good chuckle every once in a while. <clears throat> this is entitled A Grandmother on the Stand. A small town persecuting attorney called his first witness to the stand in a trial a grandmotherly, elderly woman. He approached her and asked, Miss Jones, do you know me? She responded, Why, yes, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a young boy, and frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie. You cheat on your wife. You manipulate people and talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a rising big shot. And when you haven't the brains to realize you'll never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yes, I know you. Well, the lawyer was stunned. He was just fabricating. He backed up. Not knowing what else to do, he pointed across the room and said, Miss Jones, do you know the defense attorney? She again replied, Why, yes, I do. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster, too. I used to babysit him for his parents, and he, too, has been a real disappointment to me. He's lazy. He's bigoted, and he has a drinking problem. The man can't build a normal relationship with anyone, and his law practice is one of the shoddiest in the entire state. Yes, I know him. At this point, the judge wrapped the courtroom to silence and called the counselors to the bench. 
in a very quiet voice, he said with menace, if either one of you ask her if she knows me, I'll jail you for contempt of court. <laughs> Be turning in your Bibles to the book of Amos. The book of Amos, and we'll... We'll be taking our lesson basically from Amos, and so uh, you'll want to stay with the book of Amos. About 750 B.C., before Christ, an obscure farmer and shepherd was called by God to be a prophet. The man's name was Amos. Amos' mission was to warn Israel of God's coming judgment if they did not repent. Sadly, the nation did not heed his call to repentance. As a result, the ten northern tribes, Israel itself, was led into Assyrian captivity. Part of the prophecy was an unusual famine for the word of God. Turn to Amos, the eighth chapter, in verse 11. Amos, the 8th chapter, verse 11. <clears throat> Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Today, there's a famine in the land which we live in. A famine for the Word of God. A famine for God's Word, the Bible. The famine that we have in the land today is similar to the famine that was in Amos that we're going to study about and compare, but yet it was different. So let's compare the famine for the Word of God back in Amos' time, 750 years before Christ, And make some applications and some lessons maybe we can learn from the famine that we're having today. How is it different? Number one, how is the famine different? Well, the present famine for the Word of God in America is not sent by God. On the contrary, God has sent us a feast, not a famine. We enjoy an abundance of Bibles. I'm told the number one seller in the book market is the Bible. More than two million copies a year sold. Have you ever heard of the Gideon Corporation? One of their missions and tasks is if you go to a motel and spend a night, you open a drawer, you'll find a Bible. So Bibles are plentiful. The Word of God is everywhere. Never before in the history of mankind have we accessed and enjoyed the right and privilege to God's Word. So many Bibles. Indeed, today, today's famine for the Word of God, now what's this, are you listening, is self-imposed. I don't want us to miss that point. Self-imposed. I might illustrate it by saying, what is the difference between a person who cannot read than one who can read but won't read. A self-imposed famine we're beginning to talk about. Despite such access Bible, listen to the following. Now this is a little story that somebody wrote about the Bible. I don't know who the author was, but there's a lot of truth in this. The month of January... A busy time for me. Most of the family has decided to read me through this year. 
Have you ever made that decision to come the first of the year? I'm going to read the Bible all the way through. They kept me busy the first two weeks. I'm forgotten now. February. My owner used me for a few minutes last week. He had an argument and was checking the references. March. Grandpa visited us. He kept me on his lap for an hour reading 1 Corinthians 13. April. I had a busy day. My owner was appointed to a leader of something and used me. I got to go to church for the first time this year, Easter. May. I have a few grass stains on my pages. Early flowers pressed between the pages. June. I look like a scrapbook. The stu- they stuffed me full of clippings. One of the girls got married. July. They put me in a suitcase today. I guess we're off on a vacation. I wish I could stay at home as I will be in this thing for a month. August. Still in the suitcase. September. Back home again. And in my old place, I have a lot of company. Two true stories and four funny books are on top of me. I wish I could be read as much as they are. October. They used me a little today. One of them was sick. Right now, I'm all shined up and in the center of the table. I think the preacher's coming over. November. Back in my old place. December. They are getting ready for Christmas. I'll be covered under wrapping paper and packages. There's a lot of truth in that little story. That's the way we, we treat the Bible. I had an article that I wanted to bring, and I didn't bring it, but uh, maybe some of you have seen it or you've read it. And, and what it does, it compares the Bible to the cell phone. Have any of you seen that? If I can get that, I'll bring that. It's a very interesting article. If you just compare how you use your cell phone according to the way you use your Bible. Have you ever left home without your cell phone? Would you turn around and go back and get it? Do you keep your cell phone on your side? Would you carry a Bible with you all the time? A lot of many, many things in there. A lot of things, I should say. And... Uh, if I, can, if I can get that, I'll, I'll make it available. Why is there this present day famine for the Word of God? And the answer may be found in comparing this famine with the one that's foretold by Amos. The famines are similar in the fact of materials and luxury. Materialistic. I believe today I can say without any reservation that one of the greatest enemies that face the church is materialism and worldliness, worldliness. In Amos' day, this became the cause of pride that God hated. Turn to Amos, the sixth chapter. Amos, the sixth chapter. We'll start in with about uh, verse 1. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion. And to you who feel secure in Mount Samaria. Verse 3. You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounges on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fatted calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drank wine by the bowlfuls and used the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. The sovereign Lord has sworn by himself. The Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortress. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. They did not want to think about the future. And many, many people today do not want to think about the future. 
They're interested in the now and not the hereafter. I think that's probably one reason why it's so hard to sell insurance, don't you? We cannot really see the tangible effects on it. Uh, we, we know it's a benefit in the, on life insurance if we go on and pass on it to benefit someone else. But you can't really get a hold of the thing right now. It's the hereafter. And many people never let the hereafter cross their minds. God warned Israel that luxury, luxury would cause some to forget God. Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter. Deuteronomy 8, verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, and keeping his commandments, and his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when thou hast eaten, and are full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwell therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks, now watch this word, multiply. He didn't say added to. When your herds and your flocks are multiplied, thy silver and thy gold is multiplied. And all that thou hast is multiplied. Then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Verse 17. And thou say in thy heart, My power and my and the might of my hands has gotten me this wealth. Have you ever talked to many rich people who thought that they were the ones that were responsible? They just got it all on their own. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto his father, as it is in this day. It's God who gives us the enjoyment to enjoy what we have. I mean, the ability to enjoy what we have. There are many, many rich people who wish... Some people wouldn't get their money if they could just hold on to it. Have you ever talked to people who won the lottery two or three years after they won the lottery? And you see about that. Jesus also warns of riches that could choke thus those who receive the word. Do you remember the parable of the sower? How a sower went forth to sow his seed, which the seed was uh, the word of God. Seed of the kingdom, the word of God. He said, some seed fell by the wayside. And the ground was hard. And the birds came and picked it up. It wouldn't even go. And some fell in a stony place. And they soon sprang up. But because they lacked moisture, what did they do, class? Withered away. Withered. And some fell among the thorns. And they came up and were going good. And then what happened? They were choked with what? The cares and the riches. Now that little, those few facts I read to you to start with about pondering on these things. I want you to think about some of these things. James talks about the rich people, what they do to the poor people. What did Jesus say? It's harder for a man to go to heaven than for a camel to do what? Anyone know? All right. I've heard people try to explain that away by saying, he didn't mean a sewing. There was a, a needle uh, gate over there in Jerusalem that looked like a needle, and the camels had a hard time. I've had all kinds of explanations given to me. Today, today, many in search for wealth have forgotten God. What do I need God for? Do you remember what the problem was at Laodicea, one of the churches. You remember when Sidney brought us the lesson on the seven churches and we studied about Laodicea? They said they were rich. They didn't need anything. They couldn't see their true condition. I'm afraid today we cannot see our true condition too. 
the Lord had given some advice. He said, I advise you to get some kind of salve. What kind was it? you remember? Eye salve. And put it on your eyes so that you can see how wretched and miserable and poor you are. Others have so filled their time with luxuries. They have no time for the Word of God. Example, boats, cars, houses. Now, is this, are these things wrong within themselves? Am I saying that? No, but what I am saying, don't miss this point as we go by. We need to keep our priorities straight. What does the Bible say about seek ye first what? Kingdom of God. And, and his righteousness. And then he makes the promise that the things he'd just been talking about it before will be added unto you. It takes faith to believe some of that. Well, let's look at moral corruption. Are you still in Amos? Consider how corrupt the people had become in the days of Amos. Amos, the second chapter, verse 6. Amos 2, verse 6. Thus said the Lord God, thus said the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes that pants after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go into the same maiden to perform, to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down on clothes pledged, laid to pledge by ever altar. And they drank the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Who is it among us today that can deny that immorality is not having its effect upon the church? When we think about of all the unwed mothers out in the world, and we think about the young ladies who become pregnant, or the young men who help the young women become pregnant. If you really look at it close, the church faces the same problem the world does. It's influence in the church. Now, if you think that I'm old Lane's just up on here on his soapbox, just going on and on and on, uh, I may have said this to the, this audience before, but it's worth repeating. What does it take today to cause you to blush? Let that sink in a minute. You remember old uh, Jackson when he came held us a meeting and he talking about drilling down into the scripture? Let that sink in just a minute. What today would cause you to blush? If you seen a woman walk across the street half clad in a bikini, would you think anything of it? Well, they do it all the time, Brother Lane. It's on the television. When this happens... People will not want to feed on the Word of God. And if they did, they would be uncomfortable. They say about the Bible, the Gospel, that it has a way of comforting those who are poor, who are in need. And those who are rich and arrogant, it has a way of making them feel very uncomfortable. Isn't that strange how the same message will make one group feel comfortable and the other, it'll make them feel uneasy. Because of its ability to reveal our true self, the Bible's like a mirror. It reveals how we are. It tells us how we are and what we can be. For the Word of God is quick. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirits and the joints and the mire. And watch it. And as a discerner, we got, let's use the word there, divider. I don't want to get away from the Bible, but it's the same thing here. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Illustrate, Roger. Have you ever heard someone preaching? And he preached in the Bible, and all of a sudden, it went right between what you're thinking about, your thoughts. It divides the thoughts 
in the intent of your heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto his eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4, 12, 13. We're going to reap what we sow. God is not mocked. And every one of us that think we can cover up our sins, this verse here said all things, not a few, are naked and open before God. Well, let's make a comparison on our religion today in Amos' day. The religion back then was corrupt. And Amos 8, turn to Amos 8, the fourth chapter. Amos 8, Amos 8, chapter, verse 4. Now let me state that again. Amos 8, verse 4. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new, new moon be over that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat. They wanted to get this part of the law out of the way. It was tr they wanted to get out and make merchandise. Skimping the measure. Boasting the prices. Have you ever heard in our time when a hurricane or something comes through and you need plywood and you go down to the hardwood store and they done raised it up three or four times? Boasting the prices. And cheating with dishonest scales. Buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Selling, watch this, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this? And all who live in it mourn. The whole land will rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the rivers of Egypt. <coughs> Excuse me. And that day declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious feast into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son. And the end of it like a bitter day. Today, today, people cannot wait for the services to be over. So they can work and play. Well, I was supposed to go to the race down at Talladega. I sure hope Sidney's not long winded Sunday. He just keeps on, he don't know when to quit. I won't. Now, if we're all honest, we admit there's times when. We'd like for the services to be over and get on about our businesses. If we are unable, and remember, if I point a finger out there, I have three pointing back here. If we are unable to spend sincere time in worship, then it's easy to see why we would not feed daily upon the Word of God. The present famine. We are suffering from a lack of spiritual food. We are suffering from a lack of spiritual food. And I, I do not take any pleasure in saying what I'm about to say here about some of the things that's going on in the church and some of the ways they're preaching. And they laugh and make fun of people who preach and give verse, chapter and verse of what they said. They think it's old-timey. It's old-fashioned. They'll get up and they'll tell a few stories. Some of them might tell how I was converted. Let me testify about this. We ought to be testifying about the Lord, what He's done for us. We are easily overcome with temptation. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin, David said. The Word of God keeps one from sinning. And sin will keep one from the Word of God. Even common trials of life overwhelm us. Will this help us understand why some Christians fall away? Why some young people lose interest in God's Word 
in God's church. The behavior of some elders, preachers and teachers, there are two things that are necessary, two things that are necessary to resist trial and temptations. Number one, faith in God. Faith in God. Believing that he will provide a way of escape. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, there has no temptation taken you but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And number two, a fear of God. Faith in God and a fear of God. That reverence that motivates us to turn from evil. Psalm 16 and 6, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Now watch this. Are you listening? And by the fear of the Lord, men depart evil. And the Word of God, God's Word, is designed to impart both. The conditions of many churches today is one of spiritual malnutrition, fed by and influenced by materialism and immorality. By choice, many have imposed. By choice, many have imposed a famine upon themselves. Well, what's the answer? You know, you've got up here and talked about this and that and the other. Is there an answer to this? Number one, first, we must appreciate the power of God's Word. I was watching, I got an email, and the guy had given somebody an answer from the Bible, God's Word. And the re reply was, why don't you throw away that old antiquated book and get you a, a constitution and read or something like that? No respect, no appreciation for the Word of God. But it possesses the power of creation. Hebrews 11, 3, though through faith we understand that the world was framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Did God not say in Genesis, let there be light? And he spoke it into existence. The world was framed. And by his mighty power, he continues to hold the world in place. Have you ever wondered? Surely you have. When you go outside and look up and you see all those millions of stars, why they don't run into one another all the time? It possesses the power of regeneration. James 1.18. Of his own will, but God he us with the word of truth, that we should be kind of a first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It possesses the power of sanctification, the power to set apart. Have you ever wondered why the church is so different from the world? The Word of God has sanctified the church. It's spiritual. It's doing what God says. And so it's not like the world. And so when the world sees our love for one another, by your love for one another, the Bible says, all men will know that you're my what? Disciples. And when we really have that love one for another, the world will want some of it. You can't keep them away. But when they look in and see that there's no difference what they see in here and what they see out in the world. Why should they want to change? They already got all of that. It possesses the power of preservation. Paul told the elders at Miletus there at Ephesus, he met them at Miletus and he talked about he would keep the, they would keep the church pure by the word of God. And then let me point out that the lack of knowledge, the lack of Bible knowledge has always destroyed God's people. There never has been a division that occurred in the Lord's church that I know of. 
where somebody was not honoring the Word of God. They just wanted to go their own ways. They either wanted to add to or they wanted to take away. The authority of the Word of God was not there or there wouldn't have been any division. Hosea 4 and 6, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. It possesses the power of salvation and condemns, but it can save your souls, James 1, 21. It is a standard by which all will be judged, John 12, 48. Jesus said in the last day that his words would judge us. Should this not motivate us to learn the Word of God? Don't you think from what we've said tonight, there ought to be some desire to learn the Word of God. You know, I, I make up my mind, I'm going to be a daily Bible reader. I think everybody has that desire they want to do. And the first thing I know, something is a calling. Satan is putting roadblocks in the way. You know, you've got to go over to wherever. And I get home and I'm tired and give out. Well, I missed a day, but I won't, I won't, I won't miss another one. If we're not careful, we're soon led away. We must feed upon it. Like newborn babes desire the milk of the Word, we should too. Blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting after what? Righteousness. First bell. Okay. For, uh, I, want, I want to say to you, I believe that nothing less than daily Bible reading is necessary. Now, that's harder to do. It's easier said than done. But we can do it. We eat our food daily for our bodies. What about our spiritual food for our souls? This will go a long way. This will go a long way if we daily read God's Word in ending the famine for the Word of God that we've been talking about. Does our soul, which is destined to live forever, deserve any less than the physical food that we eat from our tables? Once the habit is developed, it will be easy to practice. If we get in a, if you get in a routine, sometimes it becomes like second nature. Now I can look around this auditorium and I can just about tell you where everybody's going to sit. The seats will be vacant, but in a little bit, I, I know Ken Phillips going to be back there and Jim's going to be here. And we are creatures of habit. We need to get in the habit, and then it'll become easier for us. As we read God's Word, take time to meditate. Don't just, well, I read a chapter today. Think about what you've read, what you're reading. Meditate. And while you're meditating, pray. Pray. Pray for what? Pray for God's help that we'll have the right understanding. To understand His will and God's help that we will obey it. Let's conclude our lesson. It must have been terrible for the Israelites taken away into captivity never to return, never to return, unable to feed upon the Word of God. How tragic it is for those who impose upon themselves, ourselves, or however we want to say it, a famine for God's Word. They are neglecting the full and final revelations from God Almighty. Contending for the faith that once was delivered. Peter said we were given all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, lest at any time they should what, class? Slip. We should let them get away from us. I contend that no apostasy happens just overnight. It's a gradual thing. How many of you, in all the years you've ever been to church, 
heard a man get up and say, I am a false teacher. Listen to me closely. I'm going to lead you astray. You ever heard that? Gradual process. By their own elect, they remain captive to a sin. By God's grace, we have so much to enjoy, yet we turn away. Yet we turn away from a spiritual feast. I challenge everyone to make a commitment to study God's word, which will save your soul. Now, I don't mean make this commitment 10 years down the road. If I, I'm talking about starting now. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Do not be ashamed of the word of God, the gospel, the good news, for it is able to save your souls. If you know what it says, and we'll be doers, and we'll be doers, and we'll be doers, and not hearers only. Thank you for your kind attention. I want to thank especially Sidney. He promised me he was going to give me some of them comments like I've been giving him. <laughs> but he's, he's been very attentive, and I appreciate Sidney and the lessons that he brings to us and you know if you don't agree tell him that's what Bible study is for it's not for one individual to stand up and just look how smart I am y'all so lucky to be it. no we're here to study God's word to glean the gold nuggets from it and then when we learn about them we're supposed to forget about it right no a thousand times we're to make application. We're to make application. Thank you for your kind attention.